special job today, and my pleasure is to introduce our homegrown speaker, Dr. Yen Jiang. Dr. Um, Jiang has um, more than 20 years of academic teaching and research experience. He moved from Hong Kong Polytech University to SOAS last year. But actually, he has a long-term relationship with SOAS and the University of London in general. He graduated um, with linguistic, uh, PhD in linguistics from UCL and SOAS in 1995. And he's also an editor and contributor of SOAS Working Papers in Linguistics and Phonetics in 1993, which is now called SOAS Working Paper in Linguistics. And he has more than 60 publications, both in Chinese and English. And his, focuses, uh, his research focuses on formal semantics, competitive semantics, pragmatics, and rhetoric, among many others. So I'm sure we all enjoy getting to know his topic on um, much ado about Dill in Mandarin Chinese. OK, please join me in welcoming Yen. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, for uh, Ms. Lulu, for her um, very kind introduction. And um, it's um, really a great pleasure to uh, come to the departmental seminar uh, to give a presentation. Um, so I have um, prepared a, a rather detailed handout uh, with um, uh, glosses and romanization for Chinese sentences. So I hope that it will make it easier for those of you who don't specifically work on uh, the study of Chinese syntax, right? And, and so I am prepared to go through uh, the example sentences uh, very closely uh, together with you um, so that um, you can see the point um, of uh, this topic. Um, I title it uh, as much ado about though uh, for a special reason, because this uh, though uh, very much like um, is very much like um, the English every or the English all or the English even, right? And uh, that, strangely speaking, has uh, attracted quite a lot of attention among the Chinese um, traditional and contemporary synthetic circles. Um, it seems that everyone wants to have a dip of finger in, in the topic, right? And uh, every time the theory or the trendy theories change, then people want to do the topic again. So that is why there is, has been a steady accumulation of literature on this topic. Um, around 200 journal papers or uh, book chapters, and uh, many people um, got their PhD degrees on, for working on though whether in English or in Chinese. Um, but then uh, the majority of work um, have been done uh, in Chinese language, right? And I think that the, there is even a, a, some kind of gap between people working on Chinese from um, the English literature and people working on Chinese because um, uh, the data is rich and uh, uh, Native speakers' intuition is important in judging, in making judgments, right? Um, to the extent that um, journal papers published in Chinese, uh, in English, tend not to quote a lot of Chinese state, uh, Chinese literature, right? Uh, giving people the probably the false impression is that the authors thought up these ideas by themselves. I think that this this is an unwanted income uh, outcome, as far as I can see. So I, I will introduce the background and uh, part of the earlier work I did. And then if we have time, and then I will talk about some recent papers um, on by some, some of the uh, other colleagues and peers. Um, I think the, the, the study of um, Chinese syntax uh, is complicated in its own sense. Uh, one is that uh, Chinese um, as is well known, Chinese lacks uh, a rich morphology, right? So um, morphological and inflectional features are almost new when we study um, Chinese grammar, Chinese syntax. That makes it uh, very different from the study of syntax in Romance languages. Um, on the other hand, um, then Chinese grammarians have to rely a lot on the distribution. 
so th there can be a lot of permutation um, studies, and then people resort to um, the abstract theories on um, the analysis of language, for example, um, move WH on a language that doesn't have overt WH, right? Or uh, providing a case theoretic description of uh, Chinese in which uh, no explicit case inflections are shown at all, right? But people manage to work on it. And um, there is also the added complexity for Chinese in the sense that um, um, politically speaking, we are only allowed, for example, in uh, inner China, to talk about just one Chinese language, which is Mandarin, right? And uh, all the other variations are considered uh, to be dialectal variations. But in fact, uh, what is very prominent from a phon phonetic point of view is that many dialects are indistinguishable from one another, right? But the study of syntax is very much suppressed in the past, right? Until only very recent times. For example, the study of Shahani's grammar in, uh, has been very much suppressed to the extent that there is only uh, one um, known Shanghainese grammar written by uh, the contemporary scholars. But before him, then it was the missionaries, right? who wrote all the interesting Shanghainese grammar in French and in English a hundred years ago, right? But then um, now we can uh, try to look at these studies again. But in the past, uh, the results have been very much ignored, right, in the field. And then there is also the non-homogeneous ingredients in Mandarin Chinese, if we're talking about the very northern ones, or the southern ones, right? So it's, it's not a homogeneous language we're talking about. And finally, um, there are all these um, um, constraints because of the characters we use. So that uh, make us uh, oblivious of any possible inflections or suffixational uh, particles that may exist if we were to transcribe the language from the, the initial stage, right? But now we tend to ignore it because we only look at the characters and the characters don't recognize these. Um, this is especially um, the problem when we look at dialects, right? Um, well, the language, the, those dialects will have to follow the formal conventions of the Chinese characters without really showing their individual um, characteristics. But um, so I have. Um, Given some summaries of the idiosyncrasies of Mandarin Chinese in the first page, but I, I don't have time to talk about them in detail. And today I talk about a special problem which is um, related to the um, adverb of scope or adverb of quantification. Uh, in Chinese, there is a group of about um, uh, a dozen such um, adverbs of scope. Um, that command our attention, and each of them um, is special in the sense that um, its sense uh, can be polysemous, um, in the sense that um, we don't just have one single unique meaning for each particle, right? Um, but then for, for these adverbs of um, quantification, uh, the context uh, usually decides which interpretation we can obtain from it. But then, on the other hand, these senses are also very logical in the sense that uh, they are probably the nearest to what we want to characterize in terms of um, classical um, first order logic or um, in some modern variations like formal semantic representations. So, and uh, they are also rather different from the, um, the encoded meaning of related English um, adverbs. So for example, in English there is every, or, and then even. And then not many people would like to associate even with or, right? But in Chinese then uh, they happen to be of one encoded word, right? Or particle. Um, well, 
in general, it, this is not too specific, uh, too idiosyncratic, because if, if we look at uh, many European languages, then we do see some similarities. And that has been uh, worked on by some people that I'll mention later. So the problem I, I will talk about today is, um, well, uh, to use it in a rhetorical way, how to get even in Chinese. Right? Um, I talk about the data first because um, it, it will require us to get ourselves familiarized with the data. Right? Uh, so the first is how Chinese expresses quantification. Uh, like if we use um, the, the first order logic, then uh, we know that uh, there are ways to express uh, universal quantification and existential quantification. But what we care about here is mainly the universal quantification, which is on page one, the last line. Right? So if you want to say something like, um, every boy sleeps, right? we use the logical formula uh, as um, all x, um, there's a missing x here, all x, boy x, and sleep x, um, something like this. And then for English, um, then there are several ways of saying it. Every boy sleeps or all boys sleep. Um, and on page two, there's the um, existential variation that doesn't have to concern us here. But page uh, uh, example three um, gives us um, an ex example in Chinese, and uh, which is special. Um, it is different from English in the sense that um, Chinese has a rich classify system, right? Uh, so the expression of universal quantification, like every, well, can be reached just by the repetition of classifiers, right? And that, in fact, was the older, the more colloquial, uh, more oral way of um, expressing the idea. And that was also recorded in earlier works of um, Yuan Zhenqiao in his uh, paper notes on Chinese logic, language and logic. So um, it can be something like um, uh, 男孩个个都睡了觉, right? And so uh, we have the gloss here, um, boy and the 个个, classify, classify. The, the fact that I, I repeat the same classifier means universal quantification. Right, for Chinese. But um, that, that is one possibility. And note here that in example three, we, also, we already have this uh, use of do, uh, D-O-W, right, with the first tone. So it's do here. Um, so it seems that uh, the mere repetition of classifiers is a sufficient condition. But then, uh, at the same time, we also need do to be present. Um, so it sounds like um, uh, boy, boy, or sleep, right? Boy, boy, or sleep. So it looks a little bit uh, redundant, right? Like uh, a, a, you, you have boy, boy to talk about universal quantification, but why you have all at the same time? Uh, that is a question that... Um, uh, people talk about later in their studies. But then there is also the more common uh, expression of universal quantification in example four. Um, 每个男孩都睡了觉. That's every uh, classifier and boy and, and the all sleep. And this uh, I believe is a later kind of um, expression, uh, partially uh, westernized expression, but then in modern Chinese, uh, this com becomes more um, commonly seen, especially in written language. And it is this kind of um, sentence that commands our attention uh, when we deal with Dou. So Dou is strange in the sense that first, uh, it, it can be translated uh, as all, right? Um, and it, it expresses universal quantification. But 
it seems that on the other hand, we also have this each classify and plus now construction, right? So it seems that universal quantification is achieved uh, by these two means at the same time, right? If we take away this though, then the sentence is not considered to be well formed. So if we have um, uh, every boy sleep, that's not enough. You need this though support. Uh, so you have to say in Chinese, every boy all sleep. Um, otherwise, and people won't accept it. Right? There are some exceptions, but uh, we don't have time to talk about it. Right? So, but this is the canonical form. And so, compositionally, the, the, uh, this presents a puzzle. Right? Uh, why do we have these two bits and pieces? What is the compositional contribution of each? I think that uh, um, people working on the problem still don't come up with a satisfactory answer. Um, so here, many questions are probably still open, right? And because people don't have ready answers, then uh, a lot of people have to come up with some ad hoc stipulations. That, I think, is the, well, it's the state of the art. Right? We try to avoid uh, these arbitrary stipulations, but then um, people don't really have um, a commonly agreed solution that is satisfactory. So what is the contribution of this each, right? If it were a universally quantified structure, then why do we have though, right? Um, but do we have both of them contributing to quantification, right? In that sense, then uh, it will be at odds with the stipulation of logic, because in logic, then you tend to think that only one unit will function, uh, will serve the function of universal quantification. Um, at least we don't have a compositionally sufficient analysis for each of them. And then there is um, the 2.2 is a question that I started discussing uh, about 20 years ago first, is that um, uh, we want to know uh, what is the quantificational target of this do or o, right? So if we take this do as something like a floating quantifier, right? Then what does it quantify? So what is the, we, we call do traditionally as a, as a uh, quantifier of scope or adverb of scope. So what is in its scope, right? What does it work on? Right? And, um, um, we opened up this uh, discussion topic about 20 years ago, um, arguing that um, its um, scope, its quantificational scope is always to its left. And that uh, gave rise to a lot of uh, follow-up discussions. But why only to the left? Well, it's because um, when we study the data, it seems that Chinese simply works like this, right? And uh, it's not too surprising because if we look at the uh, NP structure in Chinese, then we know that the NP structure is strictly head final, right? And it's just typologically works like this. So um, we argue that um, the, the target of Do is always or only to the left, right? So we look at some examples, um, for example, in, in six, uh, uh, this book, uh, he, and do uh, read, and then the aspect um, optional suffix. Right. So it means that uh, he has read all these books. So uh, translation doesn't reflect the use of this uh, do here. Um, so you have to say he or read these books, and this all is related to these books, right? In the in the topic position, right? so it has to be plural, right? Generally, uh, for do to be related to the the noun phrase, so it's to the left, and the seven is a, an example where you have a. NP between the subject and the predicate. Uh, this is now taken to be grammatically 
uh, uh, the grammatical focus construction, uh, what appears between the subject and the predicate. So something like um, uh, Zhang San, zhe liang, zhe liang men ke dou shu guo le. Uh, so something like Zhang, these two courses has taken, right? But in in the universally quantified construction, you have to say Zhang, these two courses dou uh, has taken or or has taken, right? There is no special word for both. And uh, people may also wonder whether this dou here works as a universal quantifier or not, because it is simply a matter of plural MP, right? Um, but if it's not universal, at least it works like an exhaustive, exhaustive quantifier. Um, so again, the bolded um, unit is to the left of dou, right? And number eight is um, the uh, typical bar construction. Um, so uh, bar used to be a content verb, that is a verb with a concept in classical Chinese meaning hold. But then the meaning of bar uh, was semantically bleached over the change of time and the change of language. So now it is used to had a noun phrase before the predicate. Um, some people would call it a causative construction, but the causative construction, if taken in this way, uh, has a lot of non-causative meaning. So some people would also call it the dispensive or dispensary construction, right? But um, from the recent um, talk we uh, organized um, last week, uh, we also learned that some other people would argue that this bar construction simply functions as promoting one post-verbal MP to the front because there seems to be a very general, vague, and again, inexplicable phenomenon for Chinese is that the language hardly tolerates two linguistic elements after the verb, right? two visible linguistic elements, whether they are arguments or adjuncts. It simply doesn't like it. Right? Uh, there are some exceptions, but then uh, the further north you go in China, the fewer cases you will find uh, for sentences containing two linguistic units after the verb. And it's, this is considered by many people as a strange case, but this is also the, uh, the special typology for Chinese. And some people even put it in the form of an X-bar convention, right? So if you, if you are talking about this uh, X-bar convention, well, we have to be careful because other people would mistake you to be talking about X-bar syntax in general, but it's two very different things. This is descriptive case. So number eight is a sentence in which we have this special bar construction. So it's like um, uh, John uh, uh, and this, uh, this book, but headed by this bar construction. It's like um, proposing or attracting an MP or some other elements away from the post-verbal slot. So it's like this. Uh, Zhang, Ba, every book, and, and this do read once. Do read once. So it's like he uh, gave a reading to every book. So again, we see that the do uh, quantifies to its left and uh, not to its right. And then um, 10. And, um, 9 and 10 are like this as well, but in 9, we have um, the adverbial every day, time adverbial every day, so it's not in an argument position, but it's also for though to quantify over. And then 10, um, so he at the beach, right? And then, um, <coughs> <coughs> and though, yeah, take photos. So that means that he took 
photos at every point in the beach. Um, then um, the controversy um, was on some uh, apparent counterexamples, and that was um, what many papers discussed on, uh, especially works in the 1980s. Um, so I, I have included a very detailed uh, bibliography, thematic uh, bibliography containing about one third of the papers and works on this though, right? But uh, there are many others. But these are the ones that I think um, have attracted more attention. Um, so mainly in the bibliography, the works that I cited in the 1980s, they talked a lot about these descriptive counterexamples. Um, and 11 is, has now become a very famous example. Uh, almost every paper tried to deal with. Um, so it's like um, uh, Xiao Li, um, well, Xiao Li um, can probably be translated into English as uh, something like Johnny, right? Uh, Johnny and O, O, Do, um, Bai, uh, Tweet, Clothes. So uh, for this construction, then it seems that those quantificational target will have to be to its right, right? Uh, because that's what the linear order tells us. But the problem is that um, when we do a meaning analysis, we find that the sentence doesn't mean that he bought all the tweed clothes. Uh, what is meant is only that of all the things he bought, uh, they are tweed clothes. Um, so there is this um, difference between the two meanings. So um, it seems that um, the target of Do for this sentence is still not to its right, but to its left. Um, or at least it's not to its right. Uh, it is something in the presupposition of the sentence. It's like of all the things he bought, uh, they are all tweed clothes. But the sentence in the context uh, does not contain all the information. And that is typical of Chinese. Um, and that is the, uh, the, the special uh, characteristics of doing Chinese syntax, is that all the time you want to talk about the syntax pragmatics interactions, right? Because there's no morphology, right? So morphologically, you can't find evidence. So you change the context, and you change the distribution, and see what evidence you can get. Um, and then for, so, uh, this is what we propose to um, reanalyze example 11 into something uh, that will argue that the, the quantificational target of Do is not to its right, but it's something that you don't see in the presupposition. And uh, for example 12, that is another kind of um, sentence. So. If we look at the explicit sentence content, it seems that those quantificational target can only be to its right, right? He doesn't eat others um, or eat steam bread. Was I, I, in my talk, uh, there are a lot of uh, examples concerning steam bread. I, I hope you, uh, you, you're not uh, unfamiliar with it, or you know, I'll, I'll get some chance to make some for you in the future. Um, but it's, it's all about steam bread. So, um, so it's like, um, well, he doesn't eat anything else. Uh, dough eat steam bread. So it seems that um, the dough has to quantify over steam bread, but then, um, Logically speaking, it doesn't make the representation well formed if we were to translate it in this way, because you can't really say of all the steamed bread that he had it all, right? Because um, again, uh, it carries a presupposition that he has eaten something, and then of this something, all of them are steamed bread, right? So uh, again, we argued for reanalysis, um, and through which though quantifies something invisible, right? Uh, not to its right, but to something um, 
probably hidden in the presupposition, right? Um, but we, we can't really say it quantifies to the left either because what is presupposed is not explicitly stated, right? We don't know where it is. And maybe we accommodate it um, at the flesh of the thought uh, when, we, um, when we process this uh, didn't eat anything else, right? So with that, we accommodate the presupposition. And 13, right, he, he all wrote novels. So again, it doesn't mean that uh, he's the only person that created all the novels um, in a specific domain, right? Uh, what it means is that um, of all the things he wrote, there are all novels, right? And uh, not anything else like poetry. So again, uh, we argue that it is something presupposed that is quantified over by Do, but not um, the rather generic noun, noun NP to the right. right. Um, so, but this is only the type one cases that were raised by um, the uh, more senior generation of descriptive grammarians. And um, there are also the type two cases. Um, the type two cases are also tricky in the sense that um, we have the nouns in plural form appearing to the right of do, but then still, um, it seems um, that um, we don't want to uh, take them to be the target of the quantificational force of do, um, because take um, 14, for example, that I or inform them, right? Uh, so logically speaking, it seems that uh, uh, it is quite okay to say that I have informed them all, right, in Chinese. But then uh, the tricky point is that um, we have to understand this them as anaphoric. So it's, it's um, not okay if we um, replace these um, um, the, the uh, anaphora with the, the real uh, names, like um, in 12, uh, no, in 15, Xiao Wang, Xiao Li, Xiao Zhao. He said, I all notify John, Peter, Mary. That, that doesn't work. Um, because although what follows, though, um, contains three nouns, right? And we, we don't uh, usually put it in this way, right? Um, so um, I try to reanalyze the type two cases as involving anaphoric um, cases. So what Do what, uh, quantifies over is not really the anaphora, but the antecedent. And uh, the third cases involve um, WH expressions um, that have <coughs> I can um, omit because um, one puzzle that, we, that uh, many people reached is that uh, this O doesn't seem to relate to a WH word. I think it also w is the case in English because there is the awkward and this of uh, saying that um, uh, what did you all buy, right? Meaning that this what is plural, right? It seems that uh, you, you're just about to ask the content of the what, right? And so um, <coughs> it, is, it seems to give us a, a processing conflict when you say what did you all buy, right? Uh, but this all doesn't modify you but it's used to modify what. Right. Um, so I, I omit the detailed description of that. But if we look at um, um, example 19 on page 4, right, um, I want to know right, who bought what. Who bought what. That will give us usually a, a pairing list reading, right, like in A. But then it is also likely that 
for each person, uh, he or she bought a list of other things. So it makes the, the option open if we use 19. I want to know who bought what. So here, no do is involved. Uh, so I, I think that for 19, we can have both 20A and 20B as representations. But for 20, if you say, I want to know who do bought what, right? The difference, I think, is that uh, with 20, you presuppose that everyone bought a multiple list of things. So for 20, then only B is available, but not A. Right? But the, the reason we want to compare this, uh, uh, make this minimal contrast, uh, is that um, we want to show that uh, this though is related to, again, to something presupposed, but not to this uh, WH word to the right. And um, for later discussions, um, I didn't follow um, the, the topic with too many writings. But then uh, if you take a look at the uh, bibliography, then it's number 57, 58, 59. Um, the person who works, um, uh, Professor Yuan, uh, working at Beijing University, he has written um, several papers in support of this argument saying that Do never quantifies a WH word, even if you want to take the WH word as plural. Um, and then I summarize the point again in this uh, number 27 paper. Um, <coughs> so these are the three cases involving the apparent right word quantification of Do, uh, that if we can dispense with these cases, then we can argue that Do never quantifies to the right. So th this creates a, a special theoretical problem uh, or research issue within the study of Do is that several, well, quite some papers explicitly address this um, on the right word quantificational possibility of Do or on the uh, impossibility of do in doing rightward quantification, right? Um, some people would argue that because minimalist syntax never uh, rule out this possibility, therefore this is not the case, and they went on doing minimalist syntax on it. Um, well, I think that uh, well, at least we have to look at the data first, right? Um, and this is uh, still a a a heated point, because um, in the end, I will cite uh, a recent paper uh, that talks about this topic again. But then um, the study of Do um, went on. It, because Do is related to the plurals, uh, it relates to universal quantification. So um, some papers uh, started to dig out a lot of um, uh, properties in plural semantics. And they, uh, their description of Do proliferated because um, they consider uh, many plural features to be the unique features of Do quantification. Well, again, it's because um, uh, plural semantics is relatively complicated, right? So um, no thorough treat treatment has been given from the uh, point of view of plural semantics. But um, if we link this kind of study with the study and works of uh, Goddard Link, um, who um, wrote a series of papers and books on plural semantics, then we know that many things uh, match each other quite nicely. For example, for 21, which is again, um, uh, which is another example involving steam bread. Um, so, right? so he, and, and this dispensary construction, he dispensing uh, one steam bread or eat. Right? Um, superficially, it creates a conflict, right? because uh, when we want to say that Do um, quantifies on something plural, right? then how can one steam bread be quantified over by Do? But then um, 
we know that it, it relates to the, uh, the possibility of a steam bread being quantizable, right? Because uh, if you have water and you have part of water, it is still water, right? But if you have a, a man, and part of man is not a man anymore, right? But that is the case with um, steam bread. If you have part of the steam bread, that is st still steam bread, right? And when you talk about uh, the predicate of eating, then you are really using the, the action of eating to quantize over the steamed bread, right? Um, it depends on how you segment it, but then the action of eating will make the bread uh, pluralizable, right, in this way. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, this is an interesting example uh, showing that uh, plurality requirement uh, can be compromised or coerced, right, when we look at the actual meaning. And here uh, we want to say that context also provides the background. But then for 22, um, uh, that is also an uh, allowable example. So he and dispensing one bottle of water and all spill, right? So how do you spill a bottle of water? Well, we can imagine you spill it bit by bit. So you can use some um, dough or all to quantify over it, right? But uh, let's suppose that if we if we produce a sentence like 28, right? Uh, no, 27, 23, I'm sorry, 23. Then he and Ba, a glass vase, right? Or uh, throw away. Then uh, it will be harder to process if we want to think about it from the point of view of universal quantification. The sentence makes sense from another point of view, that is the even interpretation that I'll talk about later. So it's like um, we can't really coerce an, a reading for it in which we segment part of the vase bit by bit, right? Because it's made of glass, right? Unless you, you smash it, but uh, it doesn't make very natural sense to use dough to quantify over it just because uh, practically it is not um, possible to um, segment it, right? Um, so all these are related to the first foremost use of dough that is uh, it is related to its universal quantification, right? And uh, um, which is equivalent to uh, the English uh, every construction, right? But then there is the second um, use of dough, which is even, right? And the more complete construction is a lian dou. That means a link plus an MP and then plus a dou, right? And plus predicate. So um, if we say even Zhang came to the meeting, then in Chinese it would be link Zhang even or link Zhang dou come to the meeting, right? So it's like uh, Zhang is the least possible one to come. So we say link or plus Zhang, like um, I'm adding the least likely item, right? And followed by Dou. Um, and uh, th this is the second use of Dou. And sometimes it is descriptively marked as Dou 2. The third one, is the uh, meaning equivalent to already. So you say do 12 o'clock. Uh, why don't we dismiss the meeting, right? So that, that meaning uh, is, is like um, it is already 12 o'clock. So um, many textbooks and uh, grammar books would um, at least give us these three uses of do. Uh, sometimes it's called do one, do two, and do three, right? Descriptively, right? Uh, some textbooks would even come up with even more such cases. But then 
uh, from a, a point of view of uh, theoretical studies, um, we recall uh, the famous um, crisis uh, modified Occam's razor, right? And uh, that typically studies these cases and come up with a unitary treatment. That is, we give a general and abstract enough definition of those so that um, uh, we have it as the basic meaning and then all the other uh, specific meaning uh, is obtained through uh, pragmatic inference or um, is obtained uh, through the coercion of context. So um, we, I proposed a unitary treatment of Do, that is uh, gradually turning the study of Do from a dis descriptive point of view to a theoretical treatment. So we, we propose that in fact there is only one Do or O uh, which is like universal quantification. It's only that um, um, that the, the quantified scope contains nouns or a set that contains members that can either be unordered or they can be ordered in a way that if we think about it from the point of view of scalar model, then we know that some members uh, in some sets can be quantified over, but then they have their own internal scales. The, the earliest studies on scales is uh, probably uh, Gilles Fauconnier's um, pragmatic scales, right? But then later we have a few more Paul Kay and uh, uh, Goldberg um, giving us um, the notion of scalar model um, in construction grammar. So um, I was borrowing these ideas to propose that um, we can collapse three those into one. It's only that um, the target of quantification itself can involve a set which is gradable or a set which is unordered, right? Or a set which contains temporal points or intervals. So when we have temporal points or intervals, then we use do to express this um, even lateness. So that will give us the already meaning. But if we have um, a scalar treatment of the target of do as a set involving graded or scalar model, then uh, we can treat do as an even, carrying an even sense. But otherwise, then we have um, the unordered set, which will give us universal quantification. Um, so uh, at that time, but, uh, it created some differences to the study of do because before that, there were people only talking about do one, do two, and do three, right? And uh, that is the typical traditional Chinese grammatical treatment, is that they do, they divide into different categories, but if they still find some uh, discrepancies, then they divide them into further smaller categories, right? But our proposal was to treat it as a unitary one, right? It's a one do proposal. And there were a lot of fo follow up studies. People, some people talked about only two does were possible, right? Some other people still insisted that there should be three does, and some uh, agreed that there could be one do. And so over the years, uh, people work a lot on it, and hence the titles. Um, much ado about the, the topic. Um, so, this briefly summarizes the work in these areas, but I would like to make use of some final minutes to talk about some recent works. So if we take a look at um, the uh, bibliography, because most of them are in Chinese, but that, that is what the state is. On um, page um, eight, right, I want to bring your attention specifically to some works. One is um, number um, number forty. All right, that's uh, by 
uh, Sun Jiaoxuan. I mean, those of you who know him is that uh, he was um, the head of the um, Linguistic Institute of Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Um, in, in China, position does matter. <laughs> well, so that's why I mean people uh, attach great importance to his work and uh, um, his work uh, comes with a rather surprising surprising title, isn't it? <laughs> because uh, for those who know, I mean, if you talk about this, the walking out of the misleading study of Do, it seems to have some implications against some others. And indeed, if you read the paper, you find that he accused some others of committing the fallacy of dogmatism. And that, that again, is a familiar uh, notion in China because it was uh, politically related to Marxist uh, practices in the past. Right? So I, I, I was feeling a bit surprised that he wanted to use these terms. So the whole paper sounds a bit authoritarian if you want to read it, but that, that is still not the rudest one. The rudest one <laughs> is uh, somewhere in the bibliography um, by, uh, by a person called Li Wen-san, yeah, number 31. If, if, if you are interested, you can check our SOAS library database and dig out the paper and give it a reading. I mean, uh, well, th th that's also an interesting paper. But then um, the other one is um, Professor Xu Lejun's uh, paper, that's number 52. He gave a lot of interesting cases to argue that, um, well, the Chinese Tao is different from universal convocation because when you think about um, exhaustivity and when you think about um, um, the universal convocation, when you think about plurality, when you think of subjectivity, then it seems that Tao uh, always contains some um, exceptions. But we, we, I want to talk about Sun Jiaxuan's paper a little bit more because he addresses the past literature and he comes up with a, a different conclusion. Right? Um, he wanted to say that uh, the, the former studies suffer from the commitment to dogma, uh, according to him, uh, is that, a, that the study has been made unnecessarily complex, he argued, is that when you talk about um, universal computation, when you talk about uh, treating this uh, though as a maximal cover um, that is, follows, um, if for some of you who knows, that follows uh, uh, Schwarzschild's um, book uh, called Pluralities, or for some people who treat it though as a, a introduction of a scholarized constant or something. That, that, that would infuriate the logicians quite a lot. But if you're interested, you can treat, you can take a look at this uh, so-called scholarization in the Tao, which is saying um, um, in the bibliography, page seven, uh, number nine, right? universal quantification with scholarization as evidence from Chinese and English, which is in fact a, 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 a book I, I forgot to put down the publisher, I think it's Methium. Um, but I have the book if you want to take a look. And um, so he was talking about these um, unnecessary complicated cases and he was arguing that um, the target of those should be unanimously considered as a rightward quantification. Right? So that goes squarely, squarely against the early claims made by me and others. But when you look at the paper, then uh, you find that he was not really right, talking about the counter examples because what he adopted was a focus theoretic tripartite uh, reanalysis of sentences involving dope. Right? So I, I have included some excerpts from his paper towards the end um, on page five onward. Right? So if you reanalyze a sentence into uh, the focus construction that will start with the operator and then with the restriction part 
and then with the nucleus part. But if you do it in this way, then you, you distort the order of the sentence completely, right? Of course, if he wants to talk about right word quantification, that's fine, but that, that is because he has carefully maneuvered the structure to suit his uh, focus theoretic reanalysis, right? So when he's talking about right word and not right word, it's no longer in the same sense as when we talked about it, right? And um, so that's um, the major thrust of his um, paper. And uh, there have been people who are preparing um, papers against him, but then uh, I have been reviewing some papers, but because they haven't been out, so I'll have to leave it to another occasion to talk about them. Um, yeah, um, so basically that's it. Um, I think uh, the, the study of Do will still go on because people treat it in different ways, right? One recent um, PhD uh, Viva that I attended uh, was recorded on page nine. It's uh, number 68. It's by a, now a, a, she uh, has already acquired her degree, so it's Dr. Zhang Ying um, who wrote up a dissertation on a typological approach to multifunctional adverbs in Chinese, so in, which includes uh, Dou, but it's a dissertation uh, done in Hong Kong University of Science and Technology using the uh, rather new theory called uh, semantic map theory um, that has been practiced by some typologists. Um, so if you are interested, you can also um, ask me for that um, dissertation, which is extremely long, because um, she wanted to do everything. <laughs> well, uh, that's it then. Um, thank you very much. Familiarity, so um, I have I have lots of questions actually. Oh. Um, uh, you mentioned early on a few yeah. times about the tension between the kind of maybe like more oral and colloquial, and then the kind of more written maybe formal style. Yeah. Um, and okay. I wondered if you could say something about that and how it relates particularly to this. Are you seeing kind of patterns with yeah. one tendency in written forms and the other in oh yes oral forms? yes the, I think that that. As the, the Mandarin Chinese um, has the, the way it is portrayed in grammar books appears as if it is hetero, it is homogeneous, right, and uh, it is unanimously agreed by native speakers. But in fact, native speakers vary so much. For example, there is always the tension between people uh, coming from Taiwan but working on syntax and, between, and people working in mainland China because uh, there have been very sharp, harsh criticisms on the data, right? And uh, in the end, then those people from Taiwan will have to say that I have been working on a, a particular variant which is called Taiwanese Mandarin or something. Um, but then even in China, then there is also the tension between the uh, more southern Mandarin, which is very much influenced by Cantonese, Wu dialects. Well, of course, if it's an influenced by Cantonese, then it's not really considered to be authentic Mandarin. But if someone like me, who is very much influenced by Shanghainese and others, then people can't really tell, right, um, if I don't tell them that. But then the further north you go, and the, the, the more special uh, the structures would become. So I think that um, there can be a lot of disagreements on what you can say with do, right? Some people will put it in this way and other people won't agree. So a lot of papers uh, listed here, uh, they argue about a lot about the data, right? Yeah. 
Yes, please. I think the, the well, we say that modern linguistics came from the West. Mm. So, b before uh, the 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 first um, half of last century, then uh, in China there was probably only very safe to say there was only something like philology, and the philology was studied to serve the need of reading classics. So, and, uh, but then so was modern science, right? And Chinese, when in the past, in China, there were only technicians, uh, not real engineers and scientists, and technicians were not um, uh, given very high prestigious places. But of course, one possibility is that the first emperor uh, beheaded all of those people who thought metaphorically Right now, metaphysically, right, and uh, he killed about 400, 300 right, people, right. Uh, but then s Chinese grammar was also right uninteresting in one sense is that it doesn't have rich morphology, right. So what I I think a lot of conferences or classes when they look at Romance languages, then it's a lot of. Um, well, for example, Irina's projects here, right? It, it concerns a lot of morphological variations that I, I think that they simply don't exist in Chinese. So uh, that shows the variety of linguistics. But on the other hand, in China, I mean, people are many, right? I mean, for all the tea in China and for all the people in China. So whatever we study here, I mean, for each rather minor topic than uh, there are like, half a hundred people working on it, right? So always there are quite a lot of people. And now, because there are so many universities, so many PhD programs, so these topics are no longer uh, considered to be, well, uh, too restricted for these people. Um, and uh, so what, what I'm talking about here, most of uh, these topics are very familiar with, uh, by, with by people over there in China. Yeah. Um, and, and with the added fact is many people studied here and then they are now working there. <laughs> so they're, they're teaching about something <laughs> from Southwest or something. And they said usually for those people, I mean, they could uh, they left from China, I mean, uh, all quiet and, and, <laughs> and uh, uh, meek. And then after they returned from source, for example, studying government phonology, they became very aggressive. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, in, uh, I think around example 11, yeah. you have a kind of paraphrase of it, um, yeah. which was something like, of all the things you bought, yeah. there is three mm. uh, clothes. And yeah. then you also talked about this door, like two, which yeah. was the like, least likely. Uh, and yes, least even least likely, the even reading. Even yeah. reading. Um, and I was thinking that both of those really draw heavily on like real world knowledge and expectations. Yes. So you need yeah. to know. Yeah. Uh, what is expected in order to know which oh, is yes. least likely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was just interested in the kind of yeah, yeah. pragmatic of, Yeah, of so it's like um, you can always use Do for two senses. One is the even reading, one is the universally quantified reading. Uh, right? I mean, you can say, I Do ate uh, crabs or something. So it's like even I ate crabs, right? But the other possibility is that crabs I don't eat. That means I ate all the crabs. 
So uh, in some rather neutral contexts, right, you have to show through intonation that one reading is preferred. And, and again, this is especially bad when we write it down as a sentence on paper. Uh, so well, you may disagree with one reading, but the other reading is also uh, still available. So yeah. with the even eye reading, yeah. Yeah. does that mean that there was a group of people in Naik Krabs and even I Krabs as well? Um, yes. That, that means that I am probably the most likely one to be a vegetarian, like yes. Ruth. <laughs> but even I eat crabs. Right? <laughs> so again, it's this kind yeah. of less likely, like, yeah. unexpected, almost counter-exploitation. Yes, yeah. yes. That, that, that's why we build up a pragmatic scale on, 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 on top of that. Right. Um, but that, that's the way of how you explain it. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, as far as I know, um, first there was uh, this uh, paper by Fauconnier, 1975, on pragmatic scales. So he was talking about when when you talk about even, right? Uh, you can say I even bought an Apple notebook. Nothing. But then the hearer can quickly build up a pragmatic scale. So what you're talking about is that uh, an Apple Mac is probably the least kind of thing you expect to buy. Maybe you arrange it on the, on the scale of pricing, right? which is more least likely is what I uh, can least afford. Right? Uh, but on other occasions, you can build up a pragmatic scale on other things. You can say, oh, he even ate crabs, right? So that is uh, built up not probably on uh, the basis of pricing, but on the basis of personal preference. So it is a kind of pragmatic scale because there is no uh, necessary logical scale to back it. And everyone's uh, preference can be different. But the, w the reason you say even, then it gives the here are the reason to build it up, to accommodate this, the pragmatic scale, right? even if you don't uh, mention it explicitly. And then um, the, the later kind of paper that I uh, knew of was uh, by Paul Kay, because he wrote a paper called Even. Right? And that, that, then that was just as, uh, one of the series of works and dissertations. One recent one, dissertation is simply called "Getting Even," uh, let's say in English. And uh, and so in Paul Kay's paper, he introduced the the notion of a scalar model, in which uh, he he was considering all the different cases. So for Fogarty's case of pragmatic scale, it's um, two-dimensional, but uh, Paul Kay was thinking of cases uh, which can be three-dimensional or four-dimensional, although I, I, I find it hard to understand the four-dimensional scalar model, but uh, three-dimensional one, yeah, uh, he gave very good illustrations of that. And then uh, it quickly lead to uh, uh, pragmatic studies on uh, scalar meaning, right, and that, that Generally speaking, you can still say it is related to scalar model, uh, but sometimes I do find some papers or dissertations when they talk about scalar implicature. In fact, they're talking about scalar model without really talking about scalar implicature because that can be uh, should be more rigorously specified, right? With uh, what they call horn scales or, or um, others. Yes. Um, Thanks. So, and then we will, if you have any funny issues or wish to catch up with your friends and colleagues, please join us with IOE Bar. We'll <laughs>
Thank you all for your participation. Thank you for coming.